We have a great deal to discuss uh, and not enough time ever uh, to do it all in, but welcome back to our final panel, what can the trade unions do? And we're gonna try to pull together all the strands of our discussions over the three days of this event and look at the way forward for trade unions. Housekeeping before we start, interpretation is in English and in French. Uh, if you want to ask a question in the room, uh, when I ask you to give the signal, uh, please raise your hands and then Nicola will act as a coordinating point with me to give you the floor. Uh, if you have a question, you want to put it in writing, please put it in the Q&A box and please be as brief as possible so I can see at a glance what your question is and who it's for. So in this session, as we heard, and as I summarized just before the break, in all our discussions, as we work to imagine and define what a more equal society would look like and begin developing that blueprint that is in the title of this conference, the key role for trade unions in the past and in the future has been absolutely clear. But we've also heard that trade unions face some key challenges in playing that role. So how do our panel see those challenges? Uh, and what do they believe trade unions can do, should do, in order to continue playing that role in the fight against inequality? And crucially as well, what do others, what does the state need to do in order to enable them to play that role? We're going to come back on all those issues. Let me introduce all our speakers. Um, we have back with us Nicola Contouris, Research Director at the ETUI, who in a moment is going to give us some input from the research conference that took place on the first afternoon and second morning of this event. Uh, we also have with us um, Esther Lynch, delighted to welcome Esther, Deputy General Secretary of the ETUC. Susan Hayter, online from the ILO, ILO Senior Labour Relations Specialist. We have Oliver Rotig, uh, Regional Secretary at Uni Europa. And Yolanda Hill Alonso, President of the Youth Committee of the ETUC. We're gonna have a totally interactive discussion with our panel. Uh, so please do uh, send in your questions and I'll incorporate as many as I can as we go along. But first over to Nicola to give us the context, what was discussed, what came out of the research part of this event, Nicola. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. And it's been indeed uh, a very rich uh, two days. We started exactly 48 hours ago. And I think there is uh, something that uh, <clears throat> emerged very, very clearly uh, from all the sessions, from all the panels, from all the workshops, and it's uh, the centrality of trade unions in any discourse about a more equal society. And this is really important, and I would like to stress that this is completely unrelated to the fact that this event was organized by the European Trade Union uh, Confederation and by the European Trade Union Institute, because there is virtually no research these days outside these walls that uh, explores the question of inequalities and uh, certainly the quest for a more equal society that does not bring into this in, really center stage the roles that trade unions had um, the roles that the role that the state had vis-a-vis -vis trade unions whilst inequalities were increasing in the last 40 years. And of course, the role that trade unions maintain, retain, and could and should have in the future uh, in order to redress inequalities and reach a more equal society. And I would like to make very, very briefly three points uh, in order to summarize, <clears throat> uh, I think, uh, three directions of travel uh, for for our work, and uh, I will limit myself to some research-oriented considerations because uh, this is uh, a very special panel. Uh, everybody else uh, around me uh, is either an active trade unionist or somebody that has a much more intimate uh, relationship with the uh, trade union world, uh, as uh, Susan does at the ILO. Uh, so the first one is that, um, yes, trade unions have done a lot for uh, uh, redressing inequalities of the past, and there is no path to a more equal society where trade unions should not have a central role as the core actor, uh, as the core equalizer. And I think any political entity, any political project, any political party, 
any government that wants to reduce inequalities and does not place at certain center stage trade unions and the institutions over which they preside, uh, collective bargaining in particular, is not taking inequality seriously. So that's, uh, there is no point talking about leveling up unless institutions and the institutions, uh, trade unions and the institutions over which they preside are not central to the leveling up discourse. Uh, if uh, research, tells you, research tells you otherwise, if uh, political organizations and parties tell you otherwise, they're lying. And this is very, very clear. So the question is, what can the state, what should the state do in order to make the most of the equalizing potential of trade unions in the future? And what can trade unions do? And I think on the latter point, you're going to hear from uh, <coughs> some more eminently qualified uh, speakers. I think <coughs> the states have to do two things. First, remove the obstacles that in many ways they themselves have created in the past 40 years. And we need to be open about this because there is robust evidence that this has been the case. The obstacles that they have created through regulation or by uh, unleashing the power of organized corporations, uh, increasingly rich, increasingly wealthy, increasingly powerful and influential, to trade union action. There is still a serious problem all over Europe with anti-union legislation, with anti-union practices that are tolerated, were not encouraged by legislation, in spite of a nominally common human rights framework. Uh, so really trade the states have a responsibility to take trade union rights seriously but it's not just about negative freedoms and negative rights it should be really we should really have a conversation about positive duties and positive obligations any state any organization any political system planning to build an eu utopia as i think the word came up in the previous panel uh, should really take seriously the positive obligations of the state in supporting the activities of uh, uh, trade unions, in supporting the organization uh, of the trade union movement, of the labor movement. And there are important international and increasingly European obligations emerging both in uh, uh, ILO conventions, uh, increasingly in EU directives that suggest, su suggest that this is, should be the path uh, for the future role of the state in uh, uh, supporting trade unions with a view of, among the other things, reducing inequalities. Um, and I think it would be unfair, however, to characterize trade unions as simply um, organizations that are waiting for the support of the state in order to perform the function, as essential as that support is. What we have seen in uh, recent years is that uh, the role of trade unions has been rediscovered by trade unions themselves. And we have heard a number of extremely inspiring uh, stories. And of course, we are in an extremely inspired and inspiring environment here in uh, uh, Brussels with ATUC and the ATUI. I'm sure you will hear more about what unions are doing at a national level, at a supranational and European level, in order to perform their functions independently from uh, the role of the state. But it is very, very, very clear that they play a very important role for, for three reasons. First of all, they operate, eminently operate as institutions within the labor market. And the labor market is something that has emerged very, very clearly in the last two days, is the place where wealth is, is created. Now, how it's redistributed, of course, is a different story. But uh, they have a strategic role in presiding over uh, the, the, the wealth creation, which happens in labor markets. It doesn't happen uh, uh, in uh, shareholders' boards and meetings. Um, the second uh, 
important uh, function that they perform, however, they perform, and it's become clear, especially in the last session, they perform it outside the labor market as political organizations. And there is a, a big political space here uh, waiting to be filled. And it's either going to be filled by political parties that will take the role more seriously, or uh, I can see increasingly uh, trade unions um, filling up that role, whether uh, willingly or, or unwillingly, when there is demand that's going to be supplied. There is demand for a more equal society. And trade unions uh, uh, will be there. I think in terms of a more equal society, three points have come up very, very clearly. W what is it that we have to redistribute? Uh, obviously, there are questions about redistribution of income. Uh, there are more traditional questions. Uh, increasingly, questions about redistribution of wealth. And uh, I think very vividly, questions about redistribution of power. And here, again, thinking that the unions are not going to have a central law role in all these uh, discourses, is a bit like my supervisor used to say, thinking about uh, the Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. But at this point, I'm going to pause uh, because uh, uh, I think uh, we are able to hear about what the role of trade unions in a more equal society and towards a more equal society is from real trade unionists in the room. So thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Nicola. And as you say, underlining that centrality, I like your phrase, as a core equaliser. Uh, and that side question, which I'd also uh, like to hear from our panel, we're focusing on what trade unions can do, but also that question you asked about what the state can do to make the most of that potential. Um, so as I say, we're going to dive in. And I wanted to start, before we narrow down into the role of trade unions um, with this eminent panel, I wanted to really come back and get their answer as briefly as possible, if you would, uh, to what an equal society should look like, what your vision is, because we heard from Philippe Ponce and we've heard throughout this, this conference that it's easy to agree that we all are against inequalities. But as Philippe put it in the last session, it's not so easy to define what an equal society looks like. So very briefly, if you would, what is your vision, and Esther, let me start with you, uh, of an equal society, and in outline terms, the role trade unions have played and should play in that? Uh, thanks, Jackie, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm going to start answering that question by thinking back to when I was a young woman, and uh, my job as the trade union official within the company was to go up to every new person and say some, hello, my name's Esther, I'm your union rep, here's your form. And um, that first communication on their first or second day at work was so important because they needed to know that the union was on their side in the company. They needed to know who their union rep was. And importantly, they needed to know what's the union going to do to make the workplace more fair, more equal. And I think that's what I'd like to put into the debate this afternoon is that you can't really only talk about an equal society at a macro level you need to talk about an equal society in the daily reality of working people. Mm -hmm. And that means making the workplace equal. And how do you do that? Well, then you make sure workers have a voice. You make sure that you create an environment where workers can talk to each other, where the engineers and the cleaners understand that their interests are served better by sticking together. And importantly, where we challenge the unequal uh, valuation that's given all too often to the work of women. So I think the workplace is a site of struggle for equality, and we need to keep that uh, at the foremost of our minds mm -hmm. too. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you very much. And I'd be interested to hear later also if you see this other role outside the workplace, this broader role that Nicola was talking about, and indeed many people in our previous panel uh, talked about. But let's continue to build our picture of that definitional question, if you like. Suzanne Hayter, from your perspective, what does this equal society look like uh, and the fundamental role of trade unions within it? Right. So from my perspective, I, I think it will come as no surprise that um, I think it's a world of work in which all workers' fundamental rights, including freedom of association and uh, collective bargaining, are recognized as enabling rights. Um, and which one in which there is investment in the labor institutions needed to forge equality at work in all the dimensions that have been discussed over the last three days, 
including investment in collective bargaining as a public good, because we know that collective bargaining is effective in addressing inequality. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Oliver, uh, Oliver Rotig from Uni Europa, can build that picture for us of your vision. Thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you, although it's still two-dimensional and not three-dimensional, for me at least. Um, when we talk about equal society, I think the fundamental point is that workers have a genuine say. And they don't have a say only as citizens or consumers, but as workers. And that is too often forgotten when we look in particular at EU politics. There, they address citizens and uh, consumers, but not as workers. Because if you don't have a say, you don't have good working conditions, you don't have good pay. So really your roles as citizens and consumers are in jeopardy if you don't have a say at the workplace. And this is really what strong trade unions and collective bargaining is about. Let me, however, uh, add one other point. And there's often the criticism of trade unions that collective bargaining is done by the functionaries, by the big trade union bosses. That's not true. Trade union Trade unions do collective bargaining in a participatory fashion. We are doing participatory, participatory collective bargaining, and that is part of democracy. Collective bargaining is one of the key parts of real democracy in a society. And as such, we are really moving forward because uh, inequality is best combated by collective bargaining. This is a really antidote for an unequal society. I leave it as there. Thank you very much. Lots to come back to in our discussion. But Yolanda Il Alonso, on behalf of young people, uh, complete the picture for us in terms of the vision, what you think we're striving to achieve. What does the more equal society look like for you and for your generation? Thank you, Yaki. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, the pandemic and the rest of the crisis that, that we went through during these uh, years have created a lot of um, unequal uh, situations in the population, especially in the, in the young uh, people. And not all the young people has the same access uh, to employ, to housing, to education. Um, and I think this is uh, more evident after all the crisis that we went through. Uh, my vision of an equal society is a society without uh, any type of discrimination in which everyone has a fair starting point in, in the life. Um, independently or the, regardless if your parents has money or they have a privilege or what education they have or from which nationality they are. Um, all people should have um, equal access to all the uh, public services as education, public health, social services. Um, those services should be uh, uh, well funded and with quality and all the population and especially the, the young people should have access to, this, to these uh, services because these services are the main thing to eliminate all these inequalities um, that um, rather than increase them. So I think it's, it's very important and this is my vision. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. So that is the vision. And, and just to say from now on panel, uh, please don't always feel you need to wait for me to ask you a question. If you want to jump in, just signal to me and I'll bring you in. I'd like this to be very much a conversation and don't forget to our audience, if you want to put something in the Q and A box or in a little while, I'll ask if you can indicate by a show of hands if you want to ask a question, but let me come back to where Nicola started when he said no path to creating an equal society where trade unions do not have a central role as a core actor or equalizer. What, Esther, do you think are the key challenges now for you? You described uh, what you did in your first days as a trade unionist. You described your vision of making that the workplace fair and equal. But what are the challenges for trade unions now? And do you think they've changed? Are, are they the challenges you've always faced in your career as a trade unionist? Or is it different now? Are there elements that are different? So one of the great benefits of having the ETUI uh, for us in the ETUC is the great research we get. And the research tells us very clearly that uh, the that that many workers, exactly as as Nicola was it was explaining, many workers uh, are fearful 
to join a union because if they joined the union that they will face uh, either termination or they will face worse uh, conditions of employment or just generally the boss will, will treat them very badly. And I think one of the important developments uh, uh, that that is currently about to happen is the EU directive uh, on adequate minimum wages. And although it's it's called the, the directive on adequate minimum wages, one of the key provisions in it is the obligation on member states to have in place an enabling framework for collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. And uh, any member state that has less than 80% of its workforce covered by a collective agreement will be obliged to put in place an action plan to increase the number of workers covered by a collective agreement. It then says that part of that action plan needs to do two things. It needs to make sure that workers can join, if, can join the union without fear. And secondly, that it um, ensures against union busting techniques, um, to put it in legal language, to ensure against interference uh, in unions. Um, and I think the, the biggest difference between when I started out and where I am now is that, look, employers who were against the union always relied on divide and conquer, and they still do. Mm. It's the oldest trick in the book, and I still can't understand why it's the most effective, but it is. But the tools that are available to employers now on divide and conquer are a lot more sophisticated. Mm. And the language is a lot more sophisticated, and the narrative is a lot more sophisticated. And um, it's almost as if working people and all of our structures, including trade unions, are being questioned about whether our validity, we're called mm. vested interests, we're called insiders. Um, and uh, even if you look at TV programs, no, I speak, I live my life in the English culture. And if you look at all of the soap operas so we're big into soap operas those of us in the english culture and uh all of those soap operas have he heroic characters in them and for the last 30 years i don't remember any of them being a worker they're all entrepreneurs whether mm. they're small firms or whether they're stall owners or whatever and it's very hard even in our dominant culture to identify a positive representation of a worker. And you'll go looking a long, hard time to find a positive representation of a union official. Mm. If you Google union official, you see all of us on the streets. Whereas if I look at my entire life as a union official, I've spent at max of it 10% on the street and I'm well known for going to the street, yeah? My job as a union official is solving problems. It's about making sure the enterprise is successful. It's about making sure the economy is successful. It's about stopping governments making mistakes. It's about stopping employers making mistakes. So I think, I suppose it's a very long-winded rambling, and I apologize for that, but, it's a, but, it, but I'm, tr I'm trying to bring together a couple of themes which I think are important to put, to put into the discussion. So I think um, we have to, we, we have a major challenge to get across the fact that the collective bargaining is a collective benefit and get people to understand and to uh, properly support uh, trade unions as actors mm -hmm. in all of the places where we are legitimate actors, when that's the workplace, that's the society, that's uh, mm. the economy. So it is, it is winning, if you like, in the court of public opinion, this understanding of your role, and therefore your validity, as you said, you put it uh, within that system. I'm also wondering, when you talk about many workers fearing joining the unions, whether you think, because what we heard before was just how important the role of trade unions has been, not just in the workplace, but in the broader political and social discourse, and that that is now challenged, challenged by declining membership, challenged also by political parties, your traditional allies on the left, beginning to disengage. And I'm wondering, I'll come back, Esther, but also thoughts from all of you, to what extent you see those as the challenges. But let's continue to build our picture and to change the order around a little bit, not always asking the same order. Oliver, for you, the key challenges now, how do you see them? You're muted at the moment, sorry. There we go. I think Esther is very right in terms of the key challenge that uh, uh, we basically have to win in uh, the court of public opinion. I mean, uh, not to quote uh, 
Trump, but I mean, workers first. I mean, really getting this sentence back and saying, look, you are a worker. And as I said before, I mean, if you're not able to get a good say and good conditions at the workplace, it really jeopardizes all your other possibilities you have as a citizen, as a consumer. And that is something which is really not discussed publicly. I mean, everybody is discussing you're a consumer. And if you look at the media or so, you are addressed as a consumer because then you make money for business or as a citizen. But I mean, the workers at the role of empowering you there has disappeared. And that is my second point. I want to come back what uh, Esther says. The EU now basically set out an aim of 80% collective bargaining coverage. So that is basically going into our direction as trade unions. And I think we need to use the opportunity. For Uni Europa, as you can see on my background, our slogan is forward through collective bargaining. So that is what we are pushing. We need to strengthen collective bargaining. And when I look at it and take the 80% aim of the EU, the easiest and lowest hanging fruit is public procurement. That is basically the government saying, if we spend taxpayers' money, workers' money, we actually want to have uh, companies who have a collective agreement. So our campaign is no public contract without a collective agreement. And that is important. And when I go back to the strategy, there is a top down part of it that is actually an enabling framework by the EU, by national governments, which make this possibility uh, for trade unions that collective bargaining, and I mean their sector collective bargaining, works. But if we have this, if we have this enabling uh, framework, there's also the bottom up part in this regard, and that is for us organizing, getting the people together and say, it makes sense to be in a trade union, it makes sense to engage with us in collective bargaining campaigns. And there is a point, um, Jackie, colleagues, um, we have a strong trade union in Romania. They managed to get back a sector collective agreement and they have union density of over 70, 80% in the finance sector. And in Romania, you have a law which basically says you can't negotiate and you can't be recognized as a trade union if you have not more than 50% members. For years, the unions failed. One of the reasons was as soon as they had reached 50%, they went out there and were telling the employers, we now want to negotiate. And we changed it. We just waited until they had 60 and 70. And then it's much more difficult for the company to push back. But the interesting part was there are a lot of workers there who don't join a union because nobody is in the trade union movement. But if you have 60% and over lunch talk to someone and everybody, every the majority is a trade union, and everybody who is not really anti-trade union says, why am I not member there? So that is also something we uh, can do, and the 80% really leading in this. And then top down, bottom up, we actually have the strength to go to companies, to multinational companies, when I look at, your, at a European trade union organization, to push them, both from the top to the bottom, so that we get really strong sector collective bargaining everywhere, and public procurement is one of the first things what... Uh, the governments, the European just, Union can do. Just quickly follow up on that. What, when you talk about that, that convincing people to join, for you, is it the fear factor that uh, Esther just mentioned? Uh, is it this image problem that you've both talked about? And a member of our audience, Isabella Biletta, has asked, why are we only speaking about trade unions in the state? What about business models that make it difficult or even possible, impossible to join a trade union or even to get collective bargaining? Uh, Esther did allude to business model. She did allude to employers and divide and rule. But Oliver, what for you is the key to why this is such a challenge now? Well, there is obviously uh, the fear element, but uh, what uh, what we can see when we organize, and you do don't talk about lofty uh, topics, you just say, what is your problem at the workplace? And it might be just not enough toilet rolls on the toilets. I mean, so some really basic things or not the right food in, uh, in the canteen. And then people can rally. You just have to clear, make clear for them it's something which directly makes the situation better. Mm -hmm. And now when we look at inflation, I mean, this point is straightforward. We need to organize more pay for workers and we need more security because with all, uh, all the upheaval we have, we can bring this forward. So it's this, this element, what is really the main concern of a worker? That is really the bottom up approach and what I was talking about, participatory, collective bargain. I mean, people actually saying, workers saying what they want. I mean, the fear is an element, but if you basically get the opportunity, you can fight. You can see this in many of the essential workers, carers, 
security guards, cleaners would just say, we actually, if we get together, we can make a difference. And I think that is something we have to cherish, but for this, we need the framework. And that is the second question you asked mm -hmm. uh, from the floor. Um, trade unions are strong, but they need the right framework. And at the moment, in many parts, the framework has been set against us for 40 years. So we are rolling this back now, but it means you set the framework and our focus is, as I said, bottom up, top and down, and then it falls into place. And it's much easier for us to really counter those business models and say, you can't as an employer Absolutely. do as you, as you did before. The framework is key. Susan, your thoughts on this? And the key, is there any key challenges we haven't mentioned so far? So I think one of the key challenges, and it's been alluded to, but, you know, it, it relates to the business model, the increasingly um, what we at the ILO call diverse forms of work that have been um, growing. Um, and the difficulty really, not only of organizing those workers, but also those workers having, and I'm going to keep on, on this, having their rights um, recognized. I looked at some statistics recently across Europe um in the you know the legislation um which countries allow self-employed workers to negotiate collectively mm -hmm. despite the fact that the ILO for the ILO and um, 98 and 87 are universal universal um recommendations it's it's yeah it's um it's not a, a happy picture so just to say that I, again i think that this issue about the effect recognition of the right for all workers is is something that's absolutely key and then i would say some of the other obstacles is obviously you know is is representing an increasingly diverse uh membership but i think something that's come up over the last uh, few days is is um in the agenda we've seen that the agenda is is becoming um is addressing inequalities um much more effectively but i think being very aware of um these intersections the when negotiating a telework framework what what does that mean for women who who may be teleworking it could you know it could be be potentially worse for them because they're excluded from the workplace and they're being pushed into doing more um, unpaid care work so I, I think just I, I would see that as one of the not the obstacles but as one of the challenges mm. and that's something very much that's been coming through in all our discussions over the three days how multi-dimensional and complex inequalities are these intersections and indeed all our panels, particularly in the research conference, were never just looking at one aspect of this in isolation. So a central, a central challenge. And you talked about the increasing diversity of membership. I'd be interested to see to what degree you all think the changing nature of work, more remote working, the platform economy, so-called, and so on, is making a difference. But Yolanda, in terms of those key challenges, and, and particularly perhaps if you could pick up on this point about union membership and what drives people to join or not join what is the picture like among younger generations and their attitudes towards trade unions and what are there any other challenges we haven't talked about yet at all that you would highlight yeah well for in my opinion uh, one of the most pressing challenge that uh, the union are facing at the moment uh, is the decline on the membership especially uh, mm. the young membership membership um, I don't like when the people say that uh, young people doesn't care about uh, collective issues or they, they are not interested in those uh, type of things. It's not true. The young people, uh, as you all uh, saw, um, they are um, very interested in a, in a lot of uh, issues. Uh, you you can see uh, all the demonstrations, see Black Lives Matter, Me Too, the climate mobilization. Um, so um, we can clearly say that they have interest and they want to to um, have an equal society and willing to give uh, time and resources to to fight for for those uh, challenge. Um, but I have a question that uh, it is, um, and then I will I will try to give the answer. The question is, if the young people is interested in those issues and the unions they are interested as, as well in the same issues why are these two groups not more compatible? So in my opinion, I think the problem is that the unions need to innovate, revitalize and renew. Um, they, they need to be ensured that they not only survive, they need 
to, to ensure that they are the, the central uh, of the future of work. And um, obviously, um, I, I think I don't need to, to stay in this room because all of us know about it, um, uh, the, the vital role that the trade union movement uh, has played in, in achieving these inequalities. So I think the main issue is that we need to adapt to, to the new uh, forms of work, uh, try to approach in another innovative ways to the, to the young people to increase this membership, because if not, um, uh, unfortunately, the unions won't have uh, a future. I want to come back on how you do that in a little while. But Esther, just coming back uh, on the other side of this too, I want to come back, you talked in your vision was about making the workplace more fair and equal, uh, really ensuring uh, everyone has a voice. And that has been your fight and your struggle. To Nicola's point at the beginning about um, apart from them operating as institutions within the labour market, he was talking, and we heard a lot about this in our last panel, operating outside of the labour market, as, as he put it, as political organisations, and said they have a big political space waiting to be filled. Do you see that as part of your role? Do you see that as part of the role of trade unions? And if you do, what for you is the key to re reversing that declining influence and in the country you know best of course we have seen uh, a, a center-left party that is gradually disassociating itself from its trade union background it's a trend across many many countries um do you have a political role and if you do how can you get it back so 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 the two major ways to redistribute the wealth that's created in a society is firstly through wages and i've spoke about that that's the importance of empowering workers join a union and get their fair share the second way is taxes and um uh the 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 absolute importance of the voice of working people because uh, uh the moment we saw during covid windfall profit being made by some company, like, like, like out of their dreams profits. They didn't share it with the workforce. They didn't pay any, hardly any taxes. They paid less taxes proportionately than a minimum wage worker would. And they spent it to go to the moon for the day. And the only force that I see capable of really mounting a challenge to that is organized labor mm. in all of our different forms. And uh, I think that's the challenge to the leadership. I accept we need to we need to vital we need to revitalize. We need to go back and make sure we're communicating clearly with the members. But also we need to come up with a strategy that 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 puts back into uh, the economy uh, the type of investment we need to rebuild the industrial base, the type of investment we need for the for, for public services that make a, a, a decent life for working people. And I think that's 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 the link. The link is, is that your wage isn't not only what you get at the end of the week or the end mm. of the month. Your wage is the public services that you have to rely on. It's whether you can afford a home to live in. It's whether there's transport. It's whether there's jobs for the future for our children and our grandchildren, the investment in broadband. So, uh, so all of that makes up our wage. There's a bit that we get mm. from our, from our, directly from my job, but then the, the other bit is is where um, is our taxes going? What are they being paid paid towards? And 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 is there a fair burden on uh, the um, on 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 the top, we we'll say ten or increasingly one percent? Um, and I don't see that. And 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 I think that. That is the challenge for the trade unions. And how do you get that voice heard again? Because, as I say, it used to be uh, that it was listened to a lot more than it is now. Uh, and you used to be very central, certainly in the country you and I know best, uh, yeah. to the political discourse. It isn't anymore. Your voice is not heard in the same way. It's only heard in traditional, uh, you talked about the public image questions. How do you get that voice heard? And the same question to you all. But Esther, a thought on that, because it's following up on what you just said. Yeah, so, so, so I... I feel a growing sense of outrage among working people. And anybody who was here in Brussels on Monday saw 80,000 people out on the street to say their purchasing power and their wages needs to be protected. And I think there is a pent up sense of injustice, including from the time of COVID. We, I didn't travel, I didn't go back 
expect to see my family. I, you know, lots of people didn't go and visit people who were sick and subsequently died. People didn't do. And we look at the, our, our political leadership in, in, in either in the, in the European Parliament or, or, or in national governments, uh, and they're acting like the rules didn't, didn't apply to them. Mm. And then uh, people took hits in their pay. They made sacrifices. They went above and beyond for their neighbours. There's so many workers who showed up, put their lives on risk. They delivered food to make people to, to make sure that people had food at, at the end of the day. And all of this sacrifice, where's where's the where's the comeback for working mm -hmm. people? And for all of that, where is it? And I and I feel that there is a growing sense of injustice. And I think the challenge for the trade union movement will be to lead that in a positive way that brings about positive change mm. and not to allow a vacuum created where the far right moves in and has a whole set of, of, of inappropriate solutions to the problems uh, that are being faced. So I think that's, that's the challenge for us. It's to, it's, it's to focus the growing anger among working people in a way that can uh, that, 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 that we leverage that towards positive change rather mm -hmm. than uh, leaving a vacuum. And that needs uh, branch level discussions, local discussions, town hall meetings, uh, national union meetings. It means connecting with the Fridays for Future movement. It means connecting with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the, all, all of the gender equality mm -hmm. movements and bringing them all, them all together. And that's the thing that union people have union people have that ability to build alliances um and we just need to if you like mm. have the courage to step uh, into that um uh, uh, space but i think i think i mean that demonstration here in brussels uh, on monday workers meant business mm. it'll have to be changed I want to come back on that point of building alliances but yolanda just linking what esther just said to what you were saying about reversing the decline in membership making trade unions attractive to your generation is that sense of a strategy uh, that sense of filling and of filling the political space uh coming up with focusing that anger and, and showing yourselves to be the people who can deliver answers to that anger is that part of what you mean is it sort of putting the passion the politics the passion back into it as well as the hard nose issues of collective bargaining and so on is that part of the key or not well i was talking a little bit more about uh how the trade unions should uh, approach to the young people um, I think the trade union um, movement is uh, is a little bit uh, old fashioned movement that we should renew at some point to be able to approach to the young people um, in some ways. Uh, we are uh, fighting for the same uh, that they are fighting in different movements, uh, uh, young movements, I mean. And I think we should be able to, to, to bring them to the union, to tell them what we are doing, and uh, to teach them as well what is a union and what can the trade unions do for those for those uh, young workers um so basically uh, my my uh, we have a lot of uh, recent examples uh, in 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 my country where i come from from spain that uh, thanks to the trade union uh, movement thanks to to all the collective bargaining and social dialogue that the the unions did in in spain uh, the labor reform was approved and that, that labor reform bring to the young people a, a very good condition for their lives. Not only wages, I'm not talking just about wages, I'm talking about the rest. All the, 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 um, the good things that we get from the, that labor reform um, is changing the lives of millions of people, especially the precarious ones, which uh, unfortunately the young people is in, in that group. So, um, I think uh, we need to, to look at today's reality uh, to see uh, that we need to strengthen the, the, social, the social dialogue, in, in, especially in those countries that they are broken. And we need to, to strengthen as well the collective bargaining because are the main tools, in my opinion, to, to be able to improve the, the young uh, workers' condition. Thank you very much. Um, come back and I'll ask Oliver to react to that comment about uh, being a bit old fashioned in a minute. But Susan, I want to just to pick up on something uh, that your colleague Heinz Kohler said yesterday in one of our panels, because he said that COVID had had one positive impact because he said it made governments see social protection measures not as a cost, 
but as an investment. And I'm wondering in a more general sense, this return to the idea of big government, which we've seen very much during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we now, I think, are seeing more than we might have otherwise in the cost of living crisis. Is this also an opportunity, do you think, for trade unions? Because if big government is back, big dialogue, if you like, with trade unions, with the key actors in our economy, uh, is this a moment of opportunity, do you think? And that change in the perception of some of these issues you've been campaigning for for all these years, Susan? Yes, thank you. That's a yeah. It's a it's a double-sided um, question and a double-sided answer. Is big government can be a way of um, of crowding out the social partners and crowding out any collective bargaining in democracy as well. And we've seen that certainly during COVID, where um, where fundamental principles and rights were set aside and governments um, legislated and and uh, and. Got you know, um, got their business done without the trade unions. Um, at the same time, in other countries and, and many are in Europe, um, governments did go to trade unions and said, "Look, we 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 need to implement this um, very quickly, both health regulations and um, and uh, employment retention schemes." And it was because of that consultation and dialogue um, that they were able to actually implement in a very effective way their big government, right? So it's again this notion of collective bargaining as a public good. How do you use collective bargaining and see it as a public good? It was implemented, it was um, it was adjusted when it needed to be, and often also then then was able to leverage the kind of solidarities that that uh, we, we studied this in a in a report that we've just released, but the solidarities that existed where um, funds were put in place to actually um, top, up the, top up the earnings of, of low wage workers or of temporary workers and the like. I mean, you really saw that when it works well, you see it all coming together. You know, big, I wouldn't say it's big government, we should all celebrate it because we also saw the other side, which is big government squeezing out, crowding out uh, trade unions because, you know, there was a health crisis. So as you say, it's a double, potentially double-edged sword. Uh, Oliver, um, and then I'm going to go out to the room and Nicola, I'm going to ask you to indicate if there are any hands raised. But Oliver, two things for you to react to. This conversation about government and whether big government can, can be a positive or indeed that double-edged sword that Susan described. But also to Yolanda's point and something I'd like to concentrate on a bit more. She said, we're rather an old-fashioned movement. And if we want to appeal to young people, if we want to turn around the decline in membership, we're going to have to innovate, revitalise, and renew do you accept that criticism it's not directed at you but do you on behalf of trade unions accept that criticism um i accept the criticism but at the same time i would turn it around i mean trade unions are old-fashioned perhaps yes but the challenges we have are old-fashioned as well it's precariousness no uh, labor laws or less labor laws especially those people who are self-employed are in precarious conditions that's basically the 19th century when the trade union movement came about. So, and when we came about, I mean, people were shooting at us, which they still do, but at least not in most of, uh, of the European Union. So we are in a situation where we didn't have anything. And we basically, through collective bargaining, through our collective strengths, pushed forward. And there I get to big, uh, big government. I mean, government, took us on board. That's the reason why the ILO was founded. That is the reason why we got many deals after the First World War, because big government says, you're collective bargaining agents, you're trade unions, you represent the workers, and we need you to actually get rid of this mess, get out of this mess. And I think we are in a bit of a situation like this, and what Yolanda was talking, there is frustration. Esther was saying this as well. There's frustration about the, but among workers, among citizens, that there's an unequal society and something needs to be done. And that brings me back to the first point. I think what trade unions have to do, whether old fashioned uh, or not, I mean, the key point is trade unions are both are, uh, an organization who thrives on collective bargaining. That is our core feature. We negotiate collectively on behalf of the workers. And the other one, we are a political movement as well. But I mean, we can only be a strong political movement if we are strong a collective bargaining agent because this is our distinguishing feature. And so I'm a bit of a fundamentalist, single-minded, almost a single issue 
uh, approach, which uh, will always be criticized, you know, if we get collective bargaining, if we are strong, if we have 80% collective bargaining coverage, many of the other questions don't really come up because they have been solved by us working together and also big by a big government, big business or not, there is big uh, workers, big trade unions at the same time. And then we have the balance and we have an equal society. Thank you. I'd be interested to hear not just questions from the audience, but if any of our trade union members in the audience want to react to this conversation. But Esther, before I go out to the room, um, to Yolanda's point, uh, the old fashioned movement, we need to innovate, revitalize and renew, she said. Would you, ex would you agree with that? Would you accept it? I think we're a movement that reflects our membership. Mm. And I think that's why it's very important that we are vigilant and active and supportive of our young trade union leaders, um, that we listen to our young trade union leaders, um, and that we are, uh, and, and, and that we have a relevant set of demands for the challenges that are faced by young people in the labor mm -hmm. market. And, People know, I, because I often say this, is that my working life is so much better than my parents. I can't, like, I can't describe how much better my working life is than my parents was. But my son's working life looks very much like my parents' working life. No pension, mm. doesn't know, he's a chef, as, as many of you know. So, so, so that whole industry is fraught with uh, undeclared work. It's fraught with um, being asked to work too two weeks for free just to prove that you can do a job and um, being uh, conditions where the owner of the restaurant will say we're very quiet tonight I don't need you even though the person would have spent all the money to get into work washed all the clothes invested everything thinking about what they would cook that day investing all of that showing up and the employer just saying I know we're quiet go home here's a couple of quid mm. and that that is the challenge that so many young people face and when i would say to him well you need to stand up about that you know you need to stand up to it he said what type of world do you think i live in like i don't li li live in live in a world you know where it's easy to stand up to the boss it's, you know, it's easy, easy if you stand up mm. to the boss so it's not easy for me because the consequences are i'll be blacklisted and i'll never work again in this town and that and that is the real challenge but as i say and it's exactly as oliver says it's not actually a new challenge it actually is an old an old challenge and it's and it's and it's the young person's fight as well. Like, like 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 young people are going to need to to fight in the same way as my parents fought that I had a better working life. Like like so 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 we need to join up the um, the generations. We need to join up the skills. Uh, we need to join up the influence that 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 that, the, that would say the 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 more experienced people within the movement have. But absolutely, we need to be absolutely listening to young people and the genuine struggles um, and we need to make sure that the way in which the union is operating the, the time we're holding our meetings the time we're available yeah. isn't just a nine to five that it's as much about making sure that we're in the same spaces and present as young people are also what like the big thing for me if I think about it when I was a young trade unionist I loved the social bit of it as well I liked the fact that you could go and talk politics over a drink you know, we need to make sure that it's not just capitalists that have parties. We need to have parties as well, and we need to, you know, we need to get. I think, to get, I think to we'll identify that one, Esther, as the key takeaway from the three days. Yes. More parties, particularly, <laughs> particularly post COVID, particularly. But Oliver, you wanted to jump in, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the point is, I mean, I don't see it that, uh, you know, we are an old trade union movement. When I go to Central and Eastern Europe, it, those guys who were going on the attack were in the 20s, in the 30s. They are basically making the changes in Central and Eastern Europe. When we look at uh, tech workers, they're the young guys. They're not the uh, guys who are in the 40s and 50s. I think we have to make a distinction for a trade union movement, which is established, you know, where we are entrenched or so. It's easier to fight basically from the entrenchment through the structures we have. But where we are out there, we're not organized. It's the young people. And we just have to make sure that we bring those much better together as we do it now. But I mean, this image that is especially in the UK and other countries, it's just the old trade union guys who are sitting there on what they have achieved over the last 100 years and don't do anything. That's not the trade union movement. 
That is part of it, but everybody does it. I mean, you defend your positions, but you also attack on those points where you don't have strong position. That is what we are doing. And this is basically the young people doing it. And it's not the old ones who are going ahead, but it's really the dynamic young ones who have the problems very much in their face to do this. Susan, did you want to react to this? Just to say that um, the, the figures bear that out, which is that uh, where we've seen two um, areas where trade union membership has increased. The, the most dramatic increase has been amongst um, own account workers and the second amongst young people. So it is the messages getting through in some quarters. Nicola, I don't know whether there are any raised hands in the room um, or indeed if you have any questions for our panel or comments to what you've heard so far. Do we have uh, any questions from the room? I have definitely seen a couple of hands going up. Let's take so them. Let's take both of them together then if we could. Them. Could you please uh, uh, introduce yourself uh, as you... Just getting some microphones to people, I think. Thanks. Yes, Ilaria Costantini from ETY. Thanks to the speakers, uh, a wonderful conversation and uh, special thanks and congratulations to Yolanda for being elected president of the ETC Youth Committee. Very proud to ha have been a tutor in the Young Leaders course from ETY and uh, <laughs> tangible results. Uh, one question, Yolanda, uh, to you. To what extent do you think that young people would be further motivated to join a fight if this fight is run at international level? Okay. Um, so you mean uh, like if the fight is at European or international level? Yeah. Do you think that such a fight would be more attractive and engaging for young people uh, having in mind a Swedish blonde girl with... Huh? Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult question because, to be honest, um, it, the young people, um, they normally uh, think about the problems that they are having daily. So if that problem at international level is, is a problem that all the young people has, mm -hmm. like, for example, uh, we are seeing uh, a very um, atypical workers or precarious worker in, in, in the platform work. Um, so those type of uh, things, I think uh, they will be interested in to fight against uh, th this precariousness that most of the young workers are, are facing. But um, obviously, uh, it, it doesn't depend on the on the young people. It depends on the issue that that they are yeah. uh, fighting for. So if so it's an that, issue that they opinion. have in, if it's an issue that they have in common, if they have similar concerns, yes. But, but obviously there are some things that are very specific to your national context uh, where it wouldn't apply. Nicola, yeah, I, think course, yeah. that, I think you said there was another question. And also, Nicola, if you have any questions for our panel, I'd be interested to hear, but let's take the one from the floor first. No, any more, any was more there one more? questions from the floor? Yeah. Mm. I thought I'd see, no, maybe, no. I think the answer might have uh, addressed more than one. It must have addressed it, indeed. <laughs> Nicola, did you have any questions before? I've got lots, but I just wondered if there's anything you wanted to ask them. So I, I, I would like, I, I would like, if I may, to leave uh, the um, floor to the, to the trade unions mm -hmm. in, in the room, given that this session is about Absolutely. the role of trade unions. But I wanted to make a comment very quickly on something that Oliver said. It was government that took us on board. And that's, that, I think that's very important. It is true, especially in the context uh, of the creation of uh, the ILO, that eventually governments uh, understood the importance of taking trade, union, trade unions on board in order to address some existential challenges in 1919. Mm. Perhaps it took a while in order to get uh, that right. And I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, uh, the arguably two most important ILO conventions didn't emerge after the Second World War, but they emerged after the, the, the First World War, but they emerged after the Second World War. So you have uh, convention, convention 87, Convention 98 really uh, shaping the foundations. And that was in order to address some genuine existential challenges of humanity. And I think we are now echoing what uh, Esther was saying. We, governments are again taking 
unions and boards. Uh, we were speaking about EU topia uh, before. The mm. EU is again engaging with unions because there is a realization that there are some existential challenges from uh, climate change uh, to uh, inequality and everything that inequality entails in terms of uh, uh, we discussed it for today so yeah. it's a bit difficult to discuss it again yeah but governments are taking trade unions on board in some i think i think what we've also think, heard though is in some national contexts yes you say at the european level definitely but it's not happening everywhere there are some member states indeed uh, where it's less and less so. Um, and I wondered whether any of you had any thoughts. I wanted to come back really, actually take me very neatly into the next point, which is to pick up on what Esther so said just, just, about alliances. Esther, yeah. yeah just, can I just, 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 just be, be, before we lose that, that mm. question. I, want, I was, I was yeah. thinking about it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if I can. So, so, so what I notice, and it's more with political parties than trade unions, because y y Yolanda is right, Trade unionism is inherently linked with your daily struggle. Um, but I think with political parties, what I notice is that people are less inclined to join a party than they are to join an issue. Mm. You know, so you can, you, you, you can get people active around an issue and they don't want to be burdened with all the, the problems of compromise and everything that comes within uh, being being uh, somebody who's in a political party. And I think that that's something I notice in terms of the negotiation uh, with employers and with others, is that the spirit of compromise or the idea of compromise is a little bit challenged at the moment mm -hmm. in society. Um, the way in which discourse happens is you win the argument. You know, that's the way discourse is presented um, all too often. It's not about a discussion about compromise and finding middle ground. There's very little, very, very little discussion um, about that. And, and I think that um, is making it a real struggle. And that's why it's easier for people to join and support an issue than it is for, for them to be comfortable um, in joining uh, political parties and everything that goes with that. But I don't see that trade unions are burdened with that problem because the trade union being very, very grounded in the day to day um, response to the daily struggle. Mm, thank you. Oliver. Yeah, I will, uh, would like to pick up what Esther said. I mean, that is also one point why collective bargaining is the other side of, uh, you know, public democracy. I mean, collective bargaining is about democracy. Trade unionists come together, come up with a joint compromise that they basically want to negotiate with the employer. And as it is with compromising with somebody else, they don't get their compromise back, but it's a second compromise they do with the employer. And then the trade unions have to go back to their members and say, sorry, the compromise you all have done didn't really work. And I think, no, I think I'm convinced that actually collective bargaining, participatory collective bargaining is a school of democracy. You learn there that you actually have to compromise and democracy doesn't work without compromise. And one of the points we have nowadays with all those populists, they give the impression, whatever you want, you get. And that doesn't work in the family, that doesn't work in the workplace, and that doesn't work in a democracy uh, as we have it. And I think we have to get about this. I mean, this is another point where we have to change uh, the public discourse. You know, I mean, if it's just about you, you should get what you want. And then you have those uh, rat catchers who are going around and say, you get everything you want and I give it to you. And then you realize years later that you didn't get it. We need to challenge it. It's all about compromise. And otherwise, our societies and an equal society doesn't work because an equal society is not equal if everybody gets what they want without handing something in. It's just illogical. Susan? You saw me nodding my head. I did. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's the one thing is about compromise. What is really exciting about collective bargaining, and clearly I'm a believer, is that when you get beyond that compromise to actually kind of to whether whether where the whole is more than the sum of the parts where you're able to create something and meet both interests in a different way which you would never have been able to do were you just cutting the, the pie in, you know, higher 
transaction, that sort of interest-based bargaining. Um, so absolutely, it's a, it's a school of democracy. I believe it's a public good. Uh, we saw that during the we saw that during the pandemic on on Ash. We saw it being extremely important both in terms of uh, the you know those that had benefits, either sick leave or um, you know medical benefits. Um, Ash in the workplace, making sure that there was compliance so that businesses could 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 keep. Um, on, on going and then of course you know all the social protection that was provided as a as a result of collective bargaining and the collective bargaining institutions that exist which otherwise wouldn't have been can i stay with you for a moment susan and just just i wanted to come back with all of you but start with you this time susan on a point Esther made earlier about alliances mm -hmm. she talked about the need to build alliances with different movements black lives matter she mentioned the gender equality movement and so on all these different we had a conversation yesterday or i think in the research conference about relationships for example with the greens uh, as distinct from the traditional relationships with social democrat parties and so on how important do you believe this building of alliances will be uh, in order to enable trade unions to really play this role in the fight against inequalities we're talking about and do you have any thoughts on how best to go about it just to say on the first on the first question, I think the building of alliances is obviously key, and, and you know just experience shows us that um, during during the pandemic we just saw how important the alliances were in ensuring safe workplaces. And I'm just thinking of the meat packing um, industry, um, where you know alliance. I, I mean, I, yeah, alliances have just been um, important in any of the big struggles that have really um, been made. The important thing to remember about the alliances is that trade unions are still representative bodies. It's often the alliances with groups, maybe alliances with lobbying groups, which are really important, but are not representative. So mm. trade unions are very different animal to a, you know, a, a, a lobbying group. And I think that um, sometimes the two organizations are equated, and I, I think that that would... You know, you know, so what am I saying? I think it's about recognizing the strengths of both types of organizations or movements bring, and then also the differences. And this issue mm. about with who represents workers yeah. and who perhaps lobbies or uh, you know is a kind of lobbies on particular mm. issues. So who you how you choose your allies? And, and Esther, I'll give you a chance to respond, but let me collect some more thoughts first from from Yolanda and from Oliver on this question of alliances. And Yolanda. Can alliances address your key question, your central challenge of engaging with young people? Uh, is that one of the things we need to do? And if so, who should trade unions be allying with? Yeah, of course, uh, there is no doubt that uh, we need to build alliance with NGOs, with movements, uh, so, uh, civil society movements, student movements, because they, they will increase our visibility and they, they will spread as well our message. Um, but obviously, uh, we need to make sure that um, when it comes to workers' rights, the trade union should be the main actor. I mean, we can collaborate with them, but we have to, to be uh, very uh, clear on, on that point. Um, we have to be strong on our core issues and messages, and um, we cannot leave this, this place to to other actors. Um, if, you, if you let me, I will give you uh, an example, national example from, from Spain. Uh, in my trade union, uh, in our youth structure, um, we build alliance with, with a lot of student movements uh, through joint events, uh, for example, with youth uh, Europeanists uh, in order to discuss the European Year of Youth, that is, is 2022. Um, and it gave us a, a great visibility because um, the message does, does not reach only our trade union structures, it goes uh, furthermore. Um, we have also been in contact and met with various uh, student uh, associations in order to know um, their opinion. Uh, in the, we are now in Spain negotiating with the Ministry of Labour an intern statue. So we wanted to, to know their opinion, uh, to, to see what they think about this statue. Um, obviously, as I said, always uh, bearing in mind that the final decision uh, regarding the problems or the labor <laughs> negotiations of the workers relies in, in, in the trade unions. But, but of course, we, we have a lot of uh, examples of, um, of um, 
yeah, of a building alliance with, with the rest of the movement. But needing, as you and said, to be course. absolutely clear of the central role of trade unions, not not muddying the waters of who does what. Oliver, uh, a thought from you on this building of alliances, how important is it, how to get it right? And then I'll give Esther a chance to react to what you've all said. And trade unions are about alliances. Uh, let me do a first point. It is when we work, especially in the European level, where we have the experience, um, uh, the good thing is trade unions are normally stronger, broader organizations while many of the NGOs are much more agile and flexible. I mean, they have one point and can go there and we are much more broader. And this is a good combination. And we do this when we look at, uh, for instance, it's a fight uh, about Amazon. I mean, there we're working together with another, with a lot of NGOs, but also with the political parties in the parliament and even with employers. So it's really a big coalition and we do this in, in other areas as well. One of our strengths is Putting the point in there, there is actually a social dimension. Taking taking climate change or public procurement as a, as a discussion at European level, there is about we have to empower public procurement so that it, it is empowering environmental change. That's all very nice, but if you forget the social question, how will you work with it? I mean, uh, if you'd say, well, we all should now have basically electric cars and workers can't afford electric cars, but basically have to uh, buy cars which are 20 and 30 years old, it doesn't really work. It's a loose, loose situation for everyone. And I think that we have to bring in and there we are best placed to actually uh, do this, whether towards political parties, to NGOs and also to employers. I think there is really our strength and we are the biggest democratic movement in Europe. We represent more than, than several of the member states of the European Union. Indeed. Uh, Esther, a reaction to what you've heard on that, and particularly if you could pick up on the point that Su um, I think it was um, Susan made about being very aware of, of that these organisations are of a different nature, of a different quality. Some are lobbying organisations. So on. Do you see any dangers inherent? How do you pick the right people to, to ally with? So, so I think Oliver gave an excellent example about um, the importance of... Um, uh matching um the the set of demands with something that workers can actually live within the scope of um the 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 challenge with all of this is that trade unions when they're doing collective bargaining in the workplace understood you're negotiating with the employer or it could be in, in negotiating at a sector level there's then a more, we say, social dialogue function where the, the, a good example of that being the type of schemes that were introduced during COVID to make sure that people didn't lose their jobs and so there was some state money towards short-term working. So, and, and, those, and in that way, you're playing a social dialogue role. And by that, what I mean is, mm -hmm. is that the union and the workers are delivering their piece, the employers and their organizations are delivering the other bit and the government is, is delivering, we say, some of the resources to make sure that happens. And there's a real need for more of that to fight the major uh, transitions, whether it's the digital transition or the green transition. Um, both of those need uh, and would benefit from a tripartite response mm. um, in relation to both uh, developing the demands, but then delivering the demands and also uh, uh, pensions uh, to uh, making sure to deliver um, a framework that works for, for everybody, no matter what type of, um, for every worker, no matter type, what type of work they are doing. But then there's this other piece, which is just lobbying. You know, so 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 at times uh, we notice this with employers organizations um, that many of employers organizations have changed their titles to business organizations. So they're trying to deny the employer piece. And Susan <laughs> at the ILO is, is all too much aware um, of that type of um, strategy. And uh, what what those organizations want is they want an awful lot of access. They want privileged access. They want, you know, to be able to phone the prime minister or the head of the department or whoever they want. They want. They want to be able to do that. And to to my mind, the 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 role of the social partners is 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 made legitimate when we do social dialogue. If they're just off lobbying for their own interests, that's that that is not the same as coming together in social dialogue 
to um, work together. And I know, Oliver, you have been working on some demands about that in relation to the transparency register uh, as well, that, 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 that we make it very transparent um, uh, when, when the actors are acting in social dialogue, so coming together to make proposals, to look at solutions and to be legitimate actors within that arena, but not to confuse that with, with, with other pieces um, mm. uh, or, or, or other actors. And I think one of the big challenges we're going to have uh, in the coming period is the citizens' panels and the idea, the whole, this whole new piece of democracy, which is you know, participative democracy where you know, we had it on the Conference on the Future of Europe where 800 citizens were randomly chosen and then given a role to identify what proposals should be brought forward for the future of the EU treaty. Um, and uh, so, 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 so a lot of those were say new, those new um, ways uh, of operating, which I think are valuable and, and, and useful, but they can't be used to crowd out mm. the space of the representative democracy. Um, which is represented by workers as part of their trade unions. There needs to be a fundamental discussion about how those pieces fit together. A question from Aurora Triff of Dublin City University, and it relates when we come back to the debate about equality and inequality. Aurora asks, to what extent have the speakers seen a decrease in the gap between working conditions for workers on standard and non-standard contracts by worsening the conditions for standard workers? We heard yesterday a sort of leakage of what happens uh, in the non-standard world into more tra traditional forms of work. She said that we've seen this in several countries during the 2008 crisis, for example, in Greece and Romania. What is the strategy of the union, asked Aurora, in addressing the concerns uh, of the increasing share of non-standard workers? Who can pick up on that? Oliver, please. As representing the European Trade Union Con uh, Federation uh, for the services sector, I mean, we have non-standard workers right and left, whether it's cleaners, temporary agency workers, but also media workers. The first reply is, um, you know, even for those non-standard workers like self-employed for 100 years in several countries in Europe, uh, we have models how they can actually be uh, part of uh, social insurance, but more important of collective bargaining. And the point, uh, the gap, what has happened, especially in the course of the financial crisis, was uh, the guys in black suits coming and telling an island uh, in Greece and other countries, you basically have to, uh, to dismantle the collective bargaining system. And what we actually want and need to do is reversing this. We have to build up the collective bargaining system and really extend it also to more non-standard workers. Um, and there, in the discussion on platform workers, uh, we have at European level, that is really the point, extending collective bargaining to them. The commission is in the process to um, issue guidance that self-employed workers are actually covered by collective bargaining, or at least it's not an obstacle uh, to uh, the single market. And that is really important. And on this, we have to build. And as soon as we get this again, I mean, we don't want uh, collective bargaining agreements which are different uh, depending on whether you're self-employed or not self-employed. And I think this is one thing we need to do, and that is a bit of a concern of the platform workers. Do we want to have a special deal for platform workers, but uh, real-life workers who are in precarious situations get another deal? So these are some of the things uh, which we are addressing. Um, but again, if you're weak as a trade union and weak in a collective bargaining system, then it has implications for everyone. As soon as we lift it and do this well, this will have basically an equalizing effect uh, across the spectrum, including for non-standard uh, workers. And we as trade unions represent all workers, whether non-standard or standard, it doesn't matter. Susan, did you, I see you nodding there vigorously. Did you want to react to that too? Yeah, so just to say, we looked at um, over 500 collective agreements and what we found was in countries where there was higher collective bargaining coverage, and again, over 75%, um, we saw um, negotiation of, it wasn't about bringing down a standard, it was about parity. It was about ensuring that um, standard and non-standard um, were equal. Of course, where collective bargaining coverage was much lower, um, around 10%, um, it did affect Standard, standard workers. Um, again, in the 75 and, and higher, it was also about negotiating how many 
and non standard workers they were going to be, what they were going to do. It was about negotiating the terms of that as well. Um, whereas in the under 10%, there was no negotiation on the basis on which those uh, um, you know, temporary workers or temporary contracts would be employed. Thank you very much. We are coming to the end of our time. Um, I just want to double check, Nicola, are there any other hands raised in the room? I see no hands. I see no hands, and I see no others I in the Q&A box. I see one hand. Oh, you see one hand. Let's go to the one hand. <laughs> just in front of me. Um, go get a mic to the one hand. It's on its way. It's on its way, I can see. I have a marvellous view of the room here, so I can see. Uh, thank Please. Thank you very much for the panel. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo. I'm a senior researcher at the ETUI, so thank you so much. I would like to go back to the intergenerational view of the world. And knowing that the current trade union movement, the, the young one and the established one, are still... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I like established. Yes, sorry <laughs> for... Established. Very tactful. Very tactful word. <laughs> I really thought the objective... <laughs> I really thought the adjective extra. <laughs> Anyways, so, well, um, clearly two very different generations. That was my point. Uh, with a very specific uh, point in common, which okay. is that they are the same struggles. <laughs> and no, and, and uh, you see them as old fashioned, you see them as traditional ones. But I would like to have your different views about the future generation, so the girls coming after you, uh, Yolanda. Um, what do you think that will be the main three key uncertainties? Okay, for the, we're for not going to have time to do three. I'm going to have to make it my one. Sentence. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me finish my sentence, please, uh, for them to tackle. Mm -hmm. And please don't say climate change, because climate change is a, a driver. Thank you. Okay. Okay, no, I was only making the point that we don't really have time for three. So could you pick one big uncertainty that each of you think uh, is going to be key? Yolanda, let's start with you. Well, it's a difficult question. Thank you very much for your question, but it's a difficult uh, answer because uh, I hope I could, I could answer to that because I cannot see the future. But um, as they said, I agree with that, like the, the, the problems are more or less the same, that uh, old problems, I mean, they are the same problems as now. But I, I, I disagree in the point that uh, the way that we should approach to the new forms of, of work that they are changing, uh, as, as I said, drivers, platform works, those are not the same issues. We didn't have these issues before. So it is very difficult. And I don't know how to answer what is going to be the key point for the young uh, people. But for sure, uh, something that we'll, we'll, we will have to do is collective bargaining and social dialogue, and we have to continue with that. Okay. I'm not sure which one is going to be the main problem in, in the future, but, but, um, I but think the approach to what the approach to them all has to be the, the same, as you say. Uh, Oliver, can you identify one particular uncertainty you think for Yolanda and future generations, the next Yolandas? Uh, well, I think, I mean, the uncertainty is always collective bargaining. If we don't defend it, it goes down the tube. So we have to defend it and then it works. So I think, is that. Thank you. And I think you're answering. I wanted to ask the final question. So I'm going to wrap it into that because we only have a couple of minutes left. I was going to ask you of all the things we've talked about in the last hour and a half, your key priority uh, in order to ensure that trade unions can continue to play that role in fighting inequalities, to build that blueprint, to deliver that more equal society. And I think, Oliver, you've just answered it very clearly, uh, as has been your red thread through our discussion. So, Susan, a reaction, if you would, on the uncertainties for future generations and your key priority. I think the uncertainties for future generations are going to be um, around, you know, just the effect of digitalization on work organization and everything from telework and hybrid work. We've heard about the platform work and who knows what else is coming down the line and what will rub and erode our labor protections. The priority um, for me again is to make sure that freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining are recognized, the workers are able to exercise their rights. Um, and because with that, um, whatever the whatever is coming down the tube, um, or, you know, there'll, there'll be organizations and trade unions to be able to tackle it. 
Thank you very much. I want to give Esther the last word. So Yolanda, your key priority for the future, you talked about the need to innovate, revitalize, renew. What's your top priority in order to do that? Be able to reach all the non-standard workers, atypical workers, and make them uh, come, come into, the, into the unions to be able to organize them uh, because it is going to be a difficult, uh, it's a difficult challenge, but we are working already on that in, in the directive of the platform work. So I, I'm sure that uh, this is our key priority to, to bring all non-standard uh, type of workers and atypical workers uh, to be organized in the union. Thank you very much. Esther, you have the last word. What so would I'm you gonna, pull out of all this? I'm going to answer Ada's question because yep. I've been thinking about it. I had time to think about it. So, um, <laughs> and it's no surprise because everybody knows Ada runs the foresight unit for us. So thinking ahead and helping us all think ahead. So, 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 so thanks Ada for that question. The, um, I think the biggest challenge we have and we have to find a way of resolving it is the move because of artificial intelligence and robotics into the main job that we're all going to be doing is going to be the interpersonal stuff. And the challenge of that in an environment where we now have artificial intelligence monitoring that looks at you and knows just by looking at you, Esther is 30% happy, 20% angry or 50% bored. Um, in that environment, if you're being monitored, mm. and I know how important it is for so many employers that you smile and be happy, and I know it's important to them because even in a hotel, you go to a hotel, by the time you get up to your room, on your phone is, how was your check-in today? Was it a <laughs> smiley face? And in that type of an environment where just, be, just doing your job isn't going to be good enough, we're going to have to deep fake being happy because a machine is going to be able to look at us and work that out. How do we really like, 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 what is trade unionism? Like, like, what's our set of demand about that? Is it we don't let it in the workplace, which personally, I, until we can do uh, have a different way of society, that maybe that's what we do. Or maybe, or maybe we, we prohibit that emotion management and monitoring. And I think that whole space um, for the people who are coming up for say the next 10 years, that is going to be very lively. Yeah, that whole mm. artificial intelligence, the role of artificial intelligence, the role of surveillance, the different surveillance techniques. I think that is going to be very lively and very, very hot. I think way down the line, and I was just speaking to Kalina and I said, um, I'm now beginning to get private emails from people asking me whether surrogacy is work. I say, no, um, don't think so. I don't, you know, we haven't had an opportunity as a movement to discuss all of those questions. So I think that also that the 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 different, we say, um, uh, uh, roles of people and their ambitions and and all these questions and who gets paid for what, and in particular, all of my life, as all of you know, I've been looking at the role of women and, and what's expected of us from being happy all the time, right the way through to all of that. I think all of that, and 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 that's really my final big because I'm I'm here at the ETY is just to say how valuable the objective research from the ETY is on all of these questions for us that you can have these calm discussions, you can collect the research, that you can put it together and inform us in a way that we can then as a trade union movement do something um, with, uh, with, with, with finding answers to, to all of those questions. So yeah, I think the struggles are old, but the questions will be new. The way, the, the way in which this, the, the questions will show up will be very different. And Thank you. Talk. And Esther, don't go away because you and Philippe are going to close this conference in a moment. But ladies and gentlemen, will those of you in the room please join me in thanking this panel very much indeed for a great discussion. It's been a privilege for me to listen to you now, but also over the three days of debate, uh, very rich discussions, many new questions, as well as answers to some old ones. So thank you all very much from me. And now I'd like to hand over to Esther and to Philippe Pochet uh, to close uh, the conference with some final reflections. So thank you all very much from me.